musical fellowship with us. Thank you so much. Um, I think I saw everyone's name got in the bulletin except for Allie. We didn't mean to leave you out. Allie was also part of the team, so thank you, Allie. <coughs> Anjali and Natalie and Giselle and Ronnie, it's good to have your voice. Nico, Eli, Gabby, um, Jordy on the, uh, what do you call it? The, the box drum. Anyway, I am a little bit more baritone today, um, so I have a little bit of extra backup here. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to not kill my voice because I, I know I still have other things to do this afternoon. But um, I would invite you to pray with me this morning as I begin my message. Would you bow your heads with me? We just pause at this time, Lord, and we silence our hearts and we open our hearts you. So Lord, may the, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's see. There, that's the one I was looking for. This was originally going to be uh, part of my opening message at the beginning of the year, the first three Sabbaths of January, and some things got uh, delayed, and so it happens to be here on February the 4th that I'm sharing the last part of what I intended to be as a kind of just a re-invitation to examine some of the, the, the core things that drive us as, as believers, uh, looking at uh, Jesus' statements in the Sermon on the Mount, and I, I don't believe anything happens for a coincidence so although this is a little bit uh, different than I intended it, I have to believe that you're here for a reason, and this is intended by the heart of God to come to those who are here today to hear um, the message that I think God has in store for us. So um, we're going to talk about yours, mine, and ours, part three, looking at the ours part of this. I uh, miscalculated my timing that it's children's church. Normally, I have a kid's quiz before my message, but when the kids aren't here, I switch it to a teen trivia. So um, I, I, this is for the young people that are here. Nassim and wondering, uh, do we have one more who could help? Oh, Ben, my faithful micro microphone technician. Um, this is helpful um, if you want to participate. And I, I realize that uh, we've got young people kind of scattered throughout the, the sanctuary here. But it's helpful for people to hear and for it to get recorded for those at home. Um, let's talk about the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Come on, young people. You guys have very excellent ways of helping us understand this. But let's just keep it simple. There's more than one answer to this. What does the word gospel mean? Come on, let's, let's get engaged here. Let's get involved. Don't make me have to talk to your parents. Uh, the teaching or revelation of Christ. All right, the teaching and revelation of Christ. Anyone else? Gospel, what does it mean? It's kind of important that we know this. All right, Nico, he's going to enlighten us. The teachings or the revelation of Jesus, what else could it be? The good news. The good news. I think you may have overheard, got some help, but I know you knew that. Anyone else? We've got other questions. Anyone else? All right. Mr. Tomas, are you paying attention here? These are your kids now. <laughs> I know, not everyone wants to do it. It can mean a lot of things, but yes, basically it means the good news, the story or life of Jesus, the message of salvation. In Jesus' day, when they said the word gospel, they more specifically meant that the Messiah had arrived. So when Mark begins his gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he uses that word gospel, he really probably means that more literal sense. The Messiah, the anointed one, the one who is the answer to all of our problems has arrived. You may not know this, but the word gospel is not really, at least in the ancient world, not a unique term to the Jews or to the, the, the church. Gospel or euangelion, the, the Greek word, was a common word used among the Romans, the Greeks, uh, the Egyptians had a gospel. There were many other Canaanite peoples that used the term. The, the phrase good news or, or, you know, this is the solution 
to whatever our problems is was a very common phrase. So when people went around saying, oh, Jesus has the gospel, or, or we want to tell you the gospel, people would have been able to recognize or understand that within their context because there were many uh, uses of that word uh, in the Greek language in the ancient world. Although today, when you hear the word gospel, it's almost certainly concentrated within the Christian context. I've not really heard of a Buddhist gospel. I've not really heard of an atheist gospel or anything like that. Gospel tends to be relegated only to within the Christian faith today. Number two, so the gospel is the story of Jesus. So the first four books of the Bible are all called uh, gospels, but which of them actually never uses the word gospel? And I realize you're going to be guessing, unless you really know your Bibles really well, but what would, which one would you guess never uses it? Yes, sir, right here. John. Yeah. Now, did you guess or did you kind of have some idea that it might be John? All right. So, John is a unique one of the Gospels. It is, uh, the first three are called the synoptic Gospels or a similar vision or similar uh, story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of cover similar territory. John is quite different. So, while he never uses the word Gospel, certainly he is telling us the Gospel because he tells us the story of Jesus. Revelation 14, 6 is the last verse that uses the word Gospel. Let's fill in the blank here, you Seventh-day Adventist young people, and I saw another angel flying in the midheaven having a, there, it begins with an E. <laughs> what kind of gospel to preach to those who live on the earth? What's the E? All right, A, B. Everlasting. Everlasting. What's another way of saying everlasting? <laughs> oh, let's go to Angeli. Angeli. Eternal. Eternal. So yes, it, it's the same word, but the one I had on the screen was eternal. So the gospel is something that is meant to be forever. And I want you to think about this. Even if, if it's the eternal gospel, it's going to continue to be the gospel even when we're in heaven. Amen? Amen. It's going to continue to be the good news. It was the good news when Jesus came to the earth. It was the good news to the early church. It's the good news today. It's the good news for all time. And uh, God wants us to understand the eternal nature of the gospel. All right, this is the last one. The gospel is the entire focus of heaven and earth. Who on earth does God call to also share the gospel? I threw some ideas up there. Does it, is it parents, preachers, doctors, physicians? Do angels, animals? We don't call people apostles anymore, but it started with an A, so I put it there. Our coaches... Children, Christians, come on, young people, who, some of these, one of these, two of these, what do you say? All right, let's get someone to say it in a mic. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. You know, I'm not really good at trick questions, am I? Okay, yes. All creation proclaims. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you, Ben. You can just set the mic on the front pew or whatever. Yeah, even our animals. The Bible says that all creation reveals the character of God. So have you ever seen godly qualities in your dog? Loyalty, forgiveness. Have you ever seen godly qualities in your cat? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, God reveals even through nature. And so it's everybody's responsibility to be partakers of the sharing of the message of the gospel. And that really is kind of the core of what I want to share today. Paul says this in Acts chapter 20. He says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. Where did he get it? He got it from the Lord. The Lord commissioned Paul to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now you can say, well, that's fine for Paul. I mean, not everyone can be a Paul. Paul was special. Paul was unique. But Paul is simply embodies and embraces a model that all Christians can learn from. And if you go back in chapter, in, in Acts, to the very first chapter, before Jesus ascends to heaven, and I'm going to talk about this for just a moment. Before he ascends to heaven, he talks to his disciples, and he says this, this is intended to be for all believers, which is kind of an extension 
of uh, you know, Jesus' great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel or go into all the world and make uh, disciples of all nations. Here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, you will receive power. I just want you to notice, it's not a might. It's not a maybe. Okay, this is the Lord Jesus talking. He says this, you will will receive my voice vince my it's not gonna if you pray for me okay i try not to get excited i'm gonna you will receive power when the holy spirit's come upon you and you there it is again you will be you shall be my witnesses. Now, a witness is someone who says, I saw Jesus. I know who he is, and I want to share who he is. This is, the, this is the gospel. You will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Okay? This is Jesus speaking, and it's intended to all of his followers. He says, when you accept me, when you follow my will, I'm going to give you something that's called the Holy Spirit, and you will receive Power And the word power there is where we get the word dynamite, it's dunamos. It is not just a little power, it is explosive, it is dynamic, it is sufficient for the work to be done that God has given us. You will receive power. Now, whether you recognize it or not, if you have the Holy Spirit today, you have the power and the commission and the priority to be part of the gospel ministry. You have already been given it. You may not recognize it. You may not realize it. But you have been given it. And, and notice this too. I want, to, I want you to think about something. And I wish I had more time today. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to leave? Have you ever thought about that before? So Jesus has just had a major you know, accomplishment. He has gone through the cross. He's been dead and buried. He has experienced the resurrection. He has walked and talked with his disciples over a period of many weeks. And then the time comes for him to leave. Do you think that was easy for him? I don't think it was. The Bible says that God's ultimate focus and passion is the salvation of this lost world. Amen? For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus, right? This is not secondary to the priorities of heaven. Jesus' whole purpose was to bring salvation and hope to us. But part of the plan of salvation was that he needed to continue the work to satisfy the needs of the great controversy. And he had to continue to be our intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. So he didn't leave us like as an abandonment. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I leave. Because if I go, then the Father will send to you the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit can do what Jesus can't. Jesus, because of his humanity, was limited to one geographical place. But through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus can be both here and he can be at Camelback. Amen? He is a camelback, right? And he can be at PV, and he can be at Prescott, and he can be at Clearview, right? Because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is now through, a, through the third person of the Godhead able to spread the ministry. But when Jesus left planet Earth, he gave to his followers that precious job of continuing the work that he started. The gospel ministry. It's all, I mean, I, I don't mean to over embellish or, or exaggerate it, but in my mind, you, you, you tell me what you think of this uh, analogy. You chew on it for a minute. It's almost to me as significant of Jacobed putting Moses in that little basket and then having to walk away. The deliverer was in that basket, right? And G, the message of the gospel is the message of salvation, and Jesus had to give it to the church and say, I now need you to take care of this while I go and do the continuing work that is necessary for the satisfaction of the great controversy. And he puts this precious thing in our hands, and he expects us to do everything we can to nurture it and see that it is effective in this world, because without it, there is no salvation. Okay? 
When Jesus left, he entrusted us with the message of the gospel. Now again, just a, a quick dovetail here, this three part. I started out with yours is the kingdom of God. And just as a reminder, in the book of Revelation, at the Laodicean church, the message to the church, the last church, uh, in the series of the letters to the churches, the Laodicean church, the Lord says, I know that you are lukewarm, and because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Because you say that you are rich, because you say you are in need of nothing, but you don't realize your poverty, Right? And that's the message. So the the warning to us in the last days is that we will have lost our perspective, that we will have become so infused with the things of this world, we will have forgotten our our sonship and daughtership in the kingdom that God has given us, which is why the first words out of Jesus' mouth at the Sermon on the Mount, okay, when Jesus is first publicly really announcing who he is as a Messiah, he'd done some things before, I realize. But the first words out of his mouth, when he, when he finally kind of proclaims himself as the Messiah and as the one who bears the message of salvation, is blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So, so you see that juxtaposition between the way the church will be operating in the last days. We are rich. We are in need of nothing. And Jesus saying, no, you've missed it. You are poor in the light of heaven, in the context of all that I want to give you. If you choose the things of this earth, you are absolutely destitute. And I want you to have all the riches and glories and satisfactions of heaven. So the first priority of us as believers in the last days is to push against that reality of the church in the last days and realize that without Jesus, we are nothing. And His kingdom must be our first priority. His kingdom, His, that everything that heaven is must motivate and dominate our lives. Yours is the kingdom of God. And not just as servants and citizens, as sons and daughters, we are part of the kingdom of God. We are heirs. We are owners. Yours is the kingdom of God. And in order to appreciate and access that, Jesus says that we should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And His righteousness. So Jesus wraps His righteousness around us. Doesn't cover our sins. He forgives and removes our sins. And He covers our shame and our nakedness with our righteousness as a gift so that we can have the hope of salvation. Now thirdly, is this in this series is ours therefore is the ministry of the gospel now to some people the gospel stops with the first two and and again there is a a uh, there is a dynamic there is an aspect of this that i can understand where we say the gospel's first and primary mission is the individual personal salvation of me right the the promise of the gospel is that Dave Lounsbury can have hope that my sins have been forgiven, that my place has been assured in heaven, and that the righteousness and the merit of Jesus Christ has met the satisfactory uh, qualities of the law, and I will be part of the redeemed. Amen? Whoa, you don't, that, wasn't very, <laughs> that wasn't very exciting. If I'd used your name, would you have said amen louder? <laughs> The gospel is that individual promise for each of us, right? And sometimes, though, if we leave it at that, we say, that's wonderful. I love the gospel. I love that the gospel is there for me. I love that I have the hope of salvation. But, you know, the sharing part of that, the operational part, the extension of that, that's kind of a bonus, that's, you know, that's for, that's, for, that's for Dave Lounsbury. That's for the preacher. That's for the elders. That's for the holy people. That's for those that have special training. That's for those who have the time to do that. I've got other things. I'm thankful for the gospel. But the ministry of the gospel, that's a different thing. I think that the better argument is that if the gospel has really come into your life and transformed your life, you will naturally be drawn into the engagement of and the sharing of and the ministry of the gospel to your fellow man. And you will not have been able to say you've totally experienced the gospel until you have shared it. How many of you have ever been to a... Oh, my grandmother used to do this to me. Drive me crazy. Um, How many of you have ever been to a Christmas party or a, uh, a birthday party where someone refuses to open a gift? 
Not many of you. My grandma did this all the time. She was an artist when it came to, to wrapping gifts. She, I mean, she got all the creases just right, you know, and she put the bow on. I mean, when you got a present from grandma, it was like, oh my goodness, it was like a treasure because of how it was wrapped. And she treated gifts that she got as these precious, and she would take the gift, and she'd hold, oh, this is so wonderful, thank you. Okay, Grandma, go ahead and open it. Oh, but it's so lovely, I just, the wrapping is so, okay, Grandma, but what's in it? Oh, but I just hate to tear the, Grandma, open the present! And by the way, she knew, she knew she was driving us crazy. And she would play it up. But having the gospel and not sharing it, it's kind of like having that gift and never opening it. Okay? Yeah, you have it. And it's exciting. You may even kind of know what's in it. You can share. Oh, Legos. Yeah, I know. That's, that's great. Right? You might even have, you know, but until you, share, until you open it and let the community experience it, you haven't really gotten the gift. Right? The gospel is more than just the internal personal blessing that it brings into your life. It is the transformation that comes where the person of Jesus and the character of Jesus not only becomes our personal uh, blessing and saving us from sins, but gives us the same motivation that Jesus had. Jesus was motivated his entire life, his entire ministry to the service of others. And until you come to the place in your life where the power of the Holy Spirit has come into your life, and you know that he has given you the commission. And you, your very thought is, how can I bless you today? And I know it sounds almost crazy, like a pipe dream. But that's what Jesus did. He lived under the daily, the hourly, the moment idea of my purpose is to help other people come to know salvation. Because he loves everyone equally. Now, I want to... Um, I want to illustrate this as I, as I uh, come back to the Sermon on the Mount in the, uh, I guess technically in Luke, it's the Sermon on the Plain. Um, as Jesus unfolds, just a couple of statements, and then, uh, and, and then I'll bring this to a conclusion. But this is where it began. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So he begins and he goes through the Beatitudes, and, and again, Matthew has a little bit more of a, of a lengthy version, but I'm sticking with, with Luke here. And he begins it with, this is the beginning of, of how the journey is. You recognize your need. You recognize the priorities of heaven. You accept the righteousness of Christ in your life. But as it grows, a transformation is intended to take place. And I just want you to, to look at some following verses that Jesus says here and to see how this applies in the Christian life. So further down in Luke, Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, only a few verses here. Notice what Jesus said. If we are following this principle, if we're allowing the grace of God to really transform us, look what happens in our life. And I'm just picking a few things here uh, uh, for sake of time because we can't go into everything. In verse 35, he says this, but love your enemies. Okay. Now, I know we've uh, heard that before. It's not revolutionary. We've been in the church for any time at all. Um, this was quite profound, though, to the Jews that were listening because this was directly opposite of what the Pharisees had been teaching. It's on record that the Pharisees were outright teaching, you need to hate these Romans. And by the way, you should probably also hate the Samaritans. And by the way, the sinners that are amongst us, like tax collectors and prostitutes, we also need to hate them. Okay? Hatred was part of the religion. It was taught. And Jesus flips it on and said, that's not the principles of heaven. When you allow the gospel, when you allow the priorities of heaven, when you allow the person of Jesus Christ to come into your heart, you will love your enemies. In the geopolitical realm of which Jesus spoke this, this would have most immediately represented the Romans. And this is not what any Jew wanted to hear. Absolutely not. Remember, most Jews thought the Messiah would be a military commander that would help them overthrow the Romans. You have to imagine that while they were overwhelmed by the authority and the presence of Jesus Christ, they had to have struggled with this just a little. They were probably waiting for, but overthrow the Romans or, you know, let's, let's go take out the Romans. When Jesus explains in this sermon that we're to love our enemies, I think there was probably a kind of a step back, like, wait a minute, what kind of parable is this? We're supposed to love these guys? Now, in our context today, love our enemies. In a geopolitical sense, 
There are two countries that are probably the largest uh, uh, competitors with the United States of America, and both of them are acting very aggressively right now. Russia is, mount, is, is uh, amassing half a million troops, which appears to be part of a spring campaign to extend the war in Ukraine. China is making all sorts of gestures towards Taiwan and, flo and floating balloons over our country. I don't read the news on Sabbath. Last I heard, there were three balloons that just happened to be floating over our military bases. Accident. Now, I don't want to be crass about this at all. I don't want to be silly about this at all. The Bible says in the last days there will be rumors of wars and wars. You know, I have a... Where, where's my son? Oh, is he out, he's out there? I have a 15-year-old son. I have an 18-year-old daughter. Parents, have you talked to your kids about what they would do if they got drafted? Have you? I haven't. You know, there is further and further indications of an escalation, and I don't wish this, and I don't mean to be a fear monger, but as someone that is feeling responsible for what prophecy and, and history seems to be unfolding, the potential of a global conflict is increasing, is it not? And people say, well, what should we care about Taiwan? If, Ta if China takes over Taiwan, they will control the major part of the technological development of the world. Mo many computer parts are largely developed in Taiwan, and, and there's not a lot of other places you can get them. So, of course, if China takes over Taiwan, they will corner a certain part of the technological market. And the U.S. will probably want to stop that. If a global conflict comes up, some of you are old enough to remember Vietnam. There was a drafter in Korea. Some of you have parents or grandparents that may have been in World War II. It's not like these things can't happen. Have you talked to your young people about what they would do in the draft? Now, we are not a pacifist denomination, but we are a denomination that encourages non-combatancy. And it just makes me think, Mr. Tomas, maybe we should expand our CNA program or encourage it a little bit. Wouldn't it be better that we had more of our young people trained with bandages and IVs and healing so when the time comes to them to choose between that or bombs and bullets and killing, they could say, please, I'd rather be a healer. Don't make me a killer. And don't get me wrong, I love our armed forces and I take, I take a lot of honor to those who've fought and died in our military because they were following the courage of their convictions and what was a noble enterprise, but we operate by a different covenant. Jesus said, when you know that the gospel is operating in your lives, you will love your enemies. Does that mean our geopolitical enemies? Love your enemies. Here in a more domestic sense, if you happen to be a Republican or a, Dem or a Democrat, is there a lot of love between those enemies right now? How should Christians be involved in that? Boy, we should <laughs> have your opinions, but my goodness. For young people, who are your enemies? Is it a bully in class? Is it a TikTok influencer? Who is it? Do you love them? Everyone has their own way of dealing with this, their own sphere that this, there's a reality in this. But Jesus says when the gospel has gotten a hold of your heart, you begin to see the world in a new way. And he says, love your enemies and do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the most High. When the armies of darkness marched against Jesus Christ himself, Jesus told Peter, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus would rather let himself be arrested than to see his followers embrace a pattern of violence. For he himself is kind to the ungrateful and even evil. Oh, but they deserve it. They deserve it. But what did Jesus do? He loved them, and so should we. The ministry of the gospel. Oh, but didn't, wasn't David a warrior? You know, didn't Samuel hack to pieces the wicked kings that Saul had failed to kill? Uh, friends, the United States military is not the army of the Lord. 
And we don't live in the days of Joshua or Gideon or David. We live by the dictates of Jesus Christ. Love your enemies. He himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Do you love your enemies? You cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you that. Oh, I could tell some stories, but we need to move along. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now, I want you to notice this. I want you to listen to this now. Notice how Jesus puts these words. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. I want you to notice. He did not say, because you will not be judged, therefore, do not judge. Did you see the difference? The order here is important. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn. So the, the burden begins with us. In, in other words, I want you to think of this in the context of the gospel. If we are not allowing the transforming grace of God to alter the way we look at the world and extend that grace and gospel to others, if we are not uh, living a life of extending the gospel to our fellow man, if we are not following this advice, then we will not have the promise of those things being active in our lives. Am, am, I, am I saying this okay? Is this confusing? Forrest, are we together on this? Forrest and I got this, guys. Questions afterwards, talk with us. Do you, I want you to understand, the gospel does not say that you simply get to benefit from the salvation and mercy of Jesus Christ, but you have no obligation to extend that to others. It actually says the opposite. It says if you do not extend the same grace, the same mercy, the same love, the same uh, tolerance, then you yourself will cease to benefit from that which God wanted to extend to you in the first place. The, think of the parable of the uh, unforgiving servant, right? Right? Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant? He owes 10,000 talents. He can't pay a dime. And the gracious king says, I forgive you. You are forgiven. You are totally exonerated from this debt. Do you remember what he did? He goes right there and he finds one of his servants that owes him a tiny amount. And he chokes him and says, pay back everything you owe. You better pay me right away. What did the king do when he found out that his servant had behaved that way? His forgiveness was revoked because he had not extended the same mercy and grace to his fellow man. Is that a hard lesson to learn? I'll tell you what, you won't hear that in a Baptist church or in many, and I mean no disrespect, uh, it's just this is not something that churches are always excited to talk about. If we are not ready to extend the same blessings that God has given us to our fellow man, we are in danger of losing them ourselves. Is that simple enough said that way? Do not judge, then you will not be judged. Do not condemn. Oh, we're very good at condemning these days, aren't we? You didn't say that the right way I, I wanted you to say it. You didn't say the right word to me in the right word order. You looked at me with the wrong way of looking. It is pervasive. It's part of, you've heard of cancel culture, right? Or being woke. It is completely a culture dedicated to condemning. I'm going to condemn you because I don't like what you've done or said or, or even what I think you may have said or done. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Notice that last one. What is the condition of our pardon, being pardoned? Is that we will pardon others. Have you heard it, church? Have you just heard this so much, you're just, you've, you've heard it too many times? The ministry of the gospel has to be part of our life if we are going to be partakers of the gospel to begin with. He finishes up here, give, and it'll be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Being part of the ministry, being active in ministry is not a bonus. It is a natural progression of the transformation that takes place in your heart when the power of God's Holy Spirit is in your life. And He wants to do it. The Lord is coming quickly, amen? He's coming soon. What are you doing today? 
be part of the ministry of the gospel. What are you doing today to show that God has done something significant in your life and you want to share that with your fellow man? What are you doing? Associating with the church, you're giving of your time, you're giving of your resources, participating, leading worship to our ministry. That was part of it. That's the ministry of the gospel. Greeting people in the lobby, telling your coworker, hey, have you been to church lately? I think the Lord can help each of us answer that question. It's simply the, the challenge I want to leave with you. We have this year before us, 2023. Who would have thought? Time marches on, but it's not going to go on forever. What will you do in 2023 to take a larger step in being part of God's ministry and passion to make salvation available to as many as possible before his soon return? Are you being transformed daily into his image? Are you going before him in prayer and meditation, letting his life cover you and make you new to chip away at any elements of selfishness that still remain? Are you using every means in you to help others see Jesus? How much did Jesus hold back for our salvation? What are you holding back? And I think this is really is the test. Do you love even your enemies? When you think about those that you disagree with or that have hurt you, do you find yourself still at the feet of Jesus and feel his heart and his warmth helping you still see that they're a child of God. That we would see through his eyes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this is a, a challenge for all of us. None of us have arrived. Uh, there is so much more we could grow, so much more we could embrace and, and uh and be blessed by, but Lord, I just pray that each of us would be very intentional about making each day and each opportunity a chance for us to grow in our walk with you and our likeness of you, which includes not just our own satisfaction of the hope of salvation, but our great desire that those around us would have that same opportunity. It can start with our families, it can start with our children, it can start with our coworkers, but Lord, that we would have a heart that appreciates that you have made your kingdom available to us, that you have made your righteousness our shield, and that it's our privilege to come alongside your Holy Spirit and to be part of the ministry of the gospel. Help us in this endeavor, I pray. Bless us, Jesus. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Thank you so much for being